Of all the great feats of engineering that have helped to shape Britain, there's nothing more dramatic than the great chain of medieval castles on the coast of North Wales. Built over 700 years ago by Edward I to stamp his authority on his newly conquered province. Among them are some of the finest castles in the country, one of the greatest feats of royal engineering in British history. This week, I've come here to Wales to find out how a Frenchman and an English king completely changed the art of castle building forever. In 1282, the Welsh prince, Llewellyn Hap Griffid, felt strong enough behind his strongholds at Dol Badern and Dol Withlan to defy English authority and assert his independence. It was a situation which King Edward I refused to tolerate. And he was determined to obtain Llewellyn's submission by force of arms. Campaigning in Wales wasn't going to be as easy as Edward had imagined, the whole place was heavily wooded and it took 2,000 men to clear a pathway through the woods for Edward's armies. Edward fought two very hard and violent wars in Wales and he finally won when Llewellyn got killed in a minor skirmish and he was determined never to have to fight the Welsh again. He decided on Europe's most ambitious medieval building program. Like the Normans before him in England, he would subdue the Welsh with castles. Work started on three castles, Harley, Carnarvon and Conway. But it wasn't just castles that were built. At Conway and Carnarvon, the castle was put into a wall town. An idea borrowed from Gascony in southern France where Edward had been Duke. And that isn't all Edward borrowed from France. For all his castles here in Wales were actually built by a Frenchman called James of St George. Master James of St George came from St George Desperance in Savoy, which is where he got his name and where he came up with a design for a whole new style of castle while he was working as the king's architect. To understand the great advances he made in castle building and design, we have to start with a castle that the Normans had built in England 150 years earlier. Even back then, the French built the best castles. This is Eddingham Castle in Essex. It was built for a Norman lord, Aubrey de Vere, in the 12th century. Aubrey wanted to make his castle look rather posh, so he put an outer skin of dressed stone on it, you know, no doubt to impress his friends and maybe his enemies as well. Uh, you can see it's quite thin, really. It doesn't, uh, there's no headers in it or nothing, you know. In fact, considering it's so old, it, it gives you a false impression. It always almost looks as though the Victorians did it, you know, it's so neat and tidy. Really, you get a better idea of what holds the place up downstairs in the undercroft. Here I am down in the undercroft, and here, really, you can see what's holding the whole thing up. Not a lot, eh? It's really the mortar, you know. I mean, there's more mortar than there is stone, actually. And really, it's a credit to the men who mixed it, you know, because it's still quite solid after all these hundreds of years. There must have been more mortar mixers than there were stone fixers because it looks as though they put the outer skin on the outside, which is beautiful dressed stone, and then they must have maybe built 18 inches of pebbles and flints and then chucked the mortar in and as they were doing it, threw the stones in. You can also see down here a great pillar that's 14 feet square and it goes all the way up to the arch above and it takes the thrust of the whole weight of the building. 
In fact, the castle is built round a huge arch that runs right up its centre. This is a cross section of Eddingham Castle Keep, and as you can see, most of it's arches. But for these arches to stay up, you know, they're going to have something pretty big and substantial for them to spring off. You know, unlike a normal bridge from one headland to another, you need, you know, plenty of meat on each side to take the thrust of the arches. Down in the undercroft, which is the equivalent to the cellar, the walls are actually 14 feet thick with all this great weight of arches pressing down on them. On top of that, you've got the weight of a floor, plus, you know, I don't know how many nights and noblemen sat around the great table eating the venison and all that. So you don't want it falling in there, you know. And then the arch over the banqueting hall is the biggest Norman arch in all of England, something like 28 or 30 feet across. This is where the great arch emerges out of the wall. Really, you, you don't really appreciate the arch until you look at the great expanse of the floor above. If they hadn't built it, they would have had to search around for a tree maybe 50 feet long and, and two foot six square or something like that, which I'd rather think it were easier to do the arch than find such a tree. A keep like this would have been very sound and the solidity of its structural work can't be faulted. You can see how thick the walls are all the way up to the top. So when Master James came along with his new ideas, it wasn't the actual building techniques that he tattled. It was the overall shape of the castle and its outer defences that he set out to improve. Until this time, the keep had formed the art of the castle and he knows the lord of the manor and was built on a mound of earth called a mot. Next to this there was the outer stockade where everybody else lived, which was called the bailey. And the bailey had a wall round it with a gate in it. And of course the gate were the most weak bits of all the lot. And if you knocked the gate down, the enemy were in and all the defenders had to run and hide in the keep. What Master James did was to move the keep to the gate and rechristen it the Barbican. And what he did next was to do away with the motts altogether and build a series of towers round the outer wall. This made the castle much more defendable. If you did manage to breach the walls or gain entry through the Barbican, you could be fired at internally, you know, by the, the defenders who would be all on top of the walls and in, in each of the towers. You can see this at the first of his castles, which was Arlick. It's the most defensive of Master James's works. And this is hardly surprising when you think that they started building it while Edward was still at war with the Welsh. This side of the castle, without a doubt, is the best side to show the various stages of construction of it. I mean, it's very obvious if you look at the main wall, you can see at the bottom of it, it's quite rough stonework done by the soldiers while still under attack. Later on, when they had more time and a bit of protection from the bottom wall, they completed the top 25 or 30 feet in a much better fashion, better stone masonry and everything. And then, of course, last but not least, the, the bastion and the curtain wall or outer wall will be built at a later date as an extra form of defence and if the enemy did approach, they could always run and leave the trowels and the buckets of mortar for, you know, for next time, as you might say. The key to the success of the castle is this staircase, which rises 200 feet from the sea. Well, it did do before the sea receded over there. It didn't really matter if the Welsh held siege on the front or the land side of the castle. Necessary supplies could be brought in by boat, and so they could keep, you know, the Welsh at bay forever. It's up this staircase once, there must have been an army of men <laughs> carrying bags full of flour and all sorts of things. And I rather think by the time they got to the top, they'd be a bit knackered <laughs> without a shadow of <laughs> I think that's why they've got this plank here for sitting on. From this angle, you can see the way the rock had to be dug away to set the foundations of the castle directly onto the solid rock. It's as if the castle was hewn out of the rock itself. 
Having built the castle on top of a large cliff overlooking the sea, 